But this is only two. Uh, when I came to the airport, I think I had seven. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Can I introduce myself? Because I hear the same introduction every day, every time. <laughs> I could make it better. So, I could do it better. Okay, please. I'll, I'll edit. Uh, so what this introduction, ju it, it just basically says that I'm the most fallen, rotten, wretched, worthless person in the universe. But I met Prabhupada and that changed everything. And, um, and today, I feel inspired to share what I've understood from Prabhupada. Uh, I feel it's my duty, it's Prabhupada's desire. And so about 20 years ago, well, I've done, I've been temple president a few times, I've been sanctuary leader, I've done book distribution, I've done pujari service, I've done congregational service, I've done cooking, I've done college preaching, bathroom cleaning, temple cleaning, and... Uh, oh yeah, I forgot about that, yeah. And um, watching my children grow up and taking out the garbage and cleaning the dishes and all kinds of things. And about 20 years ago, I thought, I had some experience with workshops, you know, where you can go a longer time on one topic. And I thought, we should do that. And the first thing I thought is we should do japa because that's the thing everybody does every day. And then I thought we should do one on vows because we all make vows. And then um, I thought we should do one on humility because I'm so humble, I could teach it. That was a joke. Yeah. <laughs> he believed me. Yeah, go, yeah, you are humble, yeah. Um, and then I thought we should do one on forgiveness because I realized we all have a problem forgiving and we should do one on relationships and we do should one on marriage and we should do what, bef so what we should do before marriage. And basically I looked at every problem facing ISKCON and I thought we should do a workshop to deal with that before before the problem gets too bad, and before the new people have the problem, we should prevent it. So that's basically, basically what I dedicated my life to doing. And in doing that, a little lower. I'll get closer if you go lower. Make a deal with him. If he makes it lower, I'll get closer. So, so in doing, yeah, that's better. So in doing that, I learned something really, really important. If you're going to teach something, if you want to take devotees from here to here, you have to know what's in, the, in between here and here. Like, what are all the problems that get in the way? Because if you don't isolate those problems between here and here, then it, it's not practical. That was one thing I realized. And, and by teaching and trying to understand what is the real problem, Let's address that. What is the problem in chanting purely? Let's address that. Uh, and then I realized one of the biggest problems we face as devotees is we know a lot, but we don't do everything we know. So I thought, okay, well, let's do workshops where we don't just talk about it, but we do it. So I'm not going to let you out of this. I'm not going to let you go by tomorrow morning without you having improved your japa. I, I, you know, I could teach you the theology of the holy name, and I could teach you how to chant, which would be like teaching you how to fly an airplane by sitting in this classroom. You know, when you get in the cockpit, you don't know how to do it, right? You crash the airplane. So I thought, let's, not that knowledge is not necessary, but let's, let's spend time taking that knowledge and understanding how we can apply it, day in and day out, and as I said, isolating those problems that we face. So that's what I did, and so I spent the last maybe 20 years focused on doing that. And um, what I've done is I've, I've written some books to help this. I need to write more books, that's part of the plan. Many of the workshops 
that I do live are now online as self-paced courses. And so my goal is that all the workshops will be self-paced courses. I've created some books. Some of you have seen an affirmation book to help put us in the right consciousness before we chant. And I've just written, a, we just published a book on self-care because I do a self-care course. So we have self-care affirmations. And I'm going to do, uh, the next one will be, um, we're working on now, my wife is editing it now, marriage affirmations, and then we're going to do forgiveness affirmations, and we're going to do vows affirmations. So I just, I just want to help devotees take what we know and really make it practical. And so, um, you know, like we say, go from the head to the heart, get it out of your head into your heart. So that's what I've been doing, and that's what I want to do for the next three session, sessions with all of you. <laughs> which is why I'm holding this. What did you do? Yeah, okay. All right. Um, actually, it's better like this. Um, okay. Um, and if you have the question, as, as many of you would have the question, what was it like to be with Prabhupada, I have an answer, which will not satisfy you, but just because you're going to ask, I have to answer and say, I can't describe it. That's my answer. Hare Krishna, so let us welcome His Grace Mahatma Prabhu at his call BCC by once chanting the Hare Krishna Mahamantra. Hare Jai Prabhupada. Dakshna, I would like to also welcome Bhak Nishta Bhakti Mataji and Bhakta Ishan who are traveling with Mahatma Prabhu. Let us welcome them also. Once, once chanting Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Hare. Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Um, If you want to know what it was like to meet Prabhupada, just look at his disciples. Look at the people he touched. And you, you didn't meet those people before they were devotees, so you, don't, you can't see the transformation, but they were all hippies. And so, you know, you want to understand the greatness of Prabhupada, you understand the greatness of a person by how much he influences another person's life. And so by the touch of Prabhupada, so much changed in our life and, and you can see with his disciples how advanced they are, the deep realizations they have, the, the amazing things they're doing, the books they're writing and so forth, their renunciation, they, so that's all. You just, you know, that's what it's like to be with Prabhupada. Ready? Jeevadhamadhava Punjabihari Radha Madhava Kungabi Hari Gopi Janamalabha Gopi Janama Bhagavad Thari Jishodhanandana Raja Janaranjana Yasodhanandana Rajajanaranjana Jamunathiravanachari Jamunathiravanachari 
jamuna tira manachari jamuna tira manachari Punjabi Hari Jaya Radha Madhava Punjabi Hari Gopi Janabalava Giri Bhar Dhari Gopi Jana Balava Giri Bhar Dhari Yashoda Nandana Braja Jana Ranjana Jamuna Tira Vana Chari Jamuna Tira Vana Chari Punjabi Hari Radha Madhava Punjabi Hari Sisi Radha Madhava Kije Sisi What's the deity's names? <coughs> Nitai Gaur Chandra Ki Jai Pramanandi Hari Hari Go Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Shamini Tinamane Namaste Sarasati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Nivise Shishanyavari Paschajara Satarine Mukam Koroti Bachalam Pangulangayate Girin Lakrapata Maham Bande Siguru Dinatarinam Panchakao Paduru Vyascha Kupasindu Vyevacha Patitanam Pavanevyo Vaishnavevyo Namo Namaha Sri Krishna Chaitana Prabhu Nithananda Sri Advaita Gadadhara Sri Bhakshari Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Madama Hare Hare. Is Krishna, is Lord Chaitanya and Nitananda, are they present in the deities? Yes or no? That's only half the answer. It's yes and no. So what's the yes part? The yes part is premanjana charita bhakti vilochanena. You have the eyes to see because you have some bhakti, so you can see the deity, right? And the no part is if you don't have Devotion, you see brass or whatever it is, bell metal, right? Especially, I mean, you don't have so much experience because in India people are familiar with deities. But even so, we can sometimes treat the deity like a piece of marble or metal. It's possible, right? Especially in the West because people are coming with no connection with, with what is a deity, what is deity worship. And, and so they'll come into the temple, this is, you'll find this strange, but they'll come into the temple like for the first time, they'll look at the altar and they actually won't see the deities. They'll see flowers and decorations. They won't actually know there's deities on them because they don't know what deities are, especially if they see Jagannath. It's like, it's like, it's like wow, you know. It's, and so, they're looking at the deity, but they don't see the deity. What to speak of looking at the deity, at least you see the deity, but you don't really see it as a deity, you just think it's a statue or something, right? 
So this is a theological point, and it relates to the holy name. The theological point is, is Krishna present in the deity? Well, technically speaking, yes. And if you're taking a Bhakti Shastri course, and if you say yes and no, you're going to fail your course. And say, well, Mahatma Prabhu said yes and no. I'm just saying what he So it means he's failing the course also. So the academic, you know, what your teacher wants you to say is yes, but the real answer is yes and no, it depends. Well, the real answer is it depends. It depends on what? Who's seeing is Krishna in the deity? Well, it depends on who's seeing the deity, right? Doesn't it? Yes? Yeah. So can Krishna not be in the deity? No. But can you not see Krishna in the deity? Yes. So in that sense, Krishna is not in the deity. Like Prabhupada said, when, they, when the Muslims came, you know, like, well, you know, they killed Krishna. And Prabhupada said, they didn't kill Krishna. They can't see Krishna. That wasn't Krishna for them. And you can't kill Krishna anyway. So they smashed the deity and they thought they killed the Hindu god. Well, they, you know, did they see Krishna in the deity? Of course not. They didn't kill the deity. So you, you could be worshiping a deity and I'm sure this happens in India, and you think the deity is some temporary manifestation of something, right? Brahman or whatever, right? And you're not actually seeing the deity as the deity is. Although that deity is the deity, you may not be seeing it. Okay, so here's the bad news. I'm sure you came for good news, and we're starting with bad news. So please excuse me for giving you the bad news first. The bad news is, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta said, Get ready for this, everyone. This is really depressing. <laughs> Krishna is not present in offensive chanting. Wow. Now, now, start thinking about how many times you've chanted the holy name and whether Krishna was present or not. And see, how could he... Prabhupada says he's present in the holy name. How could he not be present? Okay, he's there, but you're not. Right? Ayurveda says you are wherever your mind is. That's where you are right now. If your mind is on your homework, your office, the, you know, on your stomach because you're fasting today, wherever your mind is, that's where you are. Maybe your mind is in the kitchen right now. Possible, right? It happens, doesn't it? Okay, let me ask a question. I know the answer is yes, but I have to ans ans ask it. Have you ever chanted Hare Krishna and not thought of Krishna? Yes or yes? yes. <laughs> so you are where your mind is, and you can be chanting the holy name and be somewhere else. So is Krishna in his name? Well, that's what it says. And yeah, Krishna's in his name, it's just you weren't there. You missed him. You know, you walk down the street and the prime minister comes down. But I don't, let's say I don't know who the prime minister is. So I didn't see him, although I saw him. I missed him because I didn't know Modi's the prime minister. I don't know what he looks like. So um, we'll say that statement again. Krishna is absent in offensive chanting. Wow, that's heavy, isn't it? I thought I thought I was just I thought I could just you know just chant Hare Krishna just kind of like just chant you know you ever just chant you ever you know there's chanting and there's just chanting <laughs> so you know there's there's real you know it's like anything you can do it right or you can just do it right <laughs> <laughs> That's what I call just chanting. Uh, yes. The Hindi translation is one zero six point five FM petrol. One zero one zero six point five. One zero six point five FM. You'll get the translation. All the people who speak Hindi don't know why you're laughing. And that's really frustrating, isn't it? 
Maybe the people who don't know English will get so frustrated that they'll learn English today so they can hear the lecture tonight in English. Who knows? <laughs> Anything is possible, right? So, so, we have all sometimes just chanted. Now, here's a, here's a kind of sensitive issue to ask ourselves. How often do we actually chant compared to how often do we just chant? And by just chant, I mean we're just chanting. Why? Because we have a vow to complete, right? So I've just got to get the vow done, right? So I'm just, you know, it's like, you have a job as a dishwasher and you don't like washing dishes so you like wash them as fast as you can and you know you put them to dry and they're all still greasy and you know you know prasadam is stuck on the plate you know so that was kind of like he he didn't really wash the dishes properly he just kind of got over it just got it done you know because he doesn't like to wash dishes i have a question for you have you ever been chanting japa and your only goal was just to get them done? Like there was nothing else on your mind but I got to get 16 done. Like, yes or yes? yes? Okay. That's a problem, right? Have some of you ever chanted really fast rounds because you really wanted to get them done fast? Yes or yes? yes. Did you feel relief when you got them done? Yes, 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 or yes, yes, yes. This is a problem, right? Now, if we're just chanting and not really chanting, then according to Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, Krishna is not there. And that's a problem because I just spent two hours thinking I was chanting Hare Krishna to find out only today the depressing news that Krishna wasn't even there for those two hours. And definitely, I wasn't there. I was all over the universe, but everywhere on the holy name. Have you ever chanted and not heard one round, one mantra? Has that ever happened? And when you finish your rounds, you realize, oh my God, I chanted 16 rounds and I didn't even hear one mantra. Did that ever happen to you? Raise your hand if that never happened to you. Because if, that's, if you raise your hand, you're definitely an incarnation. <laughs> but... But for all of us ordinary mortals, that happens, right? Now, here's the problem. Why, when someone taught us to chant, didn't they tell us that this is going to happen? Nobody told us, right? <laughs> they just said, chant. You know, here's the bead, you chant, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. You know, like, go to the next bead, and when you get to this end of the beat, turn around. That's basically all we heard. And, and they'll say, pronounce it and hear it, right? And if your mind wanders, just try to listen, yeah. If you're lucky enough to even know that your mind's wandering, that's, that's, a, that's a skill in itself, right? So when your mind wanders, bring it back. Yeah, and after I finished 16 rounds, I finally realized my mind was wandering for the last two hours. So now what do I do? Like, so I just wasted two hours, you know? Isn't it? So we don't want to waste two hours. This is the bad news that everybody before you came today thought, if I just chant 16 rounds, I'm going back to Godhead. Right? Because Prabhupada said that, right? So all I have to do is somehow or other. And I, I get to go back to Godhead, right? And I could do that. If I do it fast, I could do it in one hour and 20 minutes, you know. Only one hour and 20 minutes of suffering is better than chanting slowly two hours, you know, suffering, <laughs> suffering for two hours, right? Yeah? Yeah. Okay. You know, comedy means to reveal what people think, the stupid things people think. So we're laughing because we know it's true, right? Hare Krishna. So... What happens when you chant Nam Maparad spiritually? You do not make spiritual advancement with Nam Maparad. You make spiritual advancement with Nam Abbas. And you get Prema with Shuddha Nam, right? But you can't get to Shuddha Nam unless you chant Nam Abbas, a reflection. 
you know, I mean, the sun's out. It's not noon, but it's pretty bright, right? We can see. So Bhaktivinoda Thakur said, the only thing you get from Namaparat is some material piety. You get no, nothing spiritual, no anartha nibriti, none of that. With Namabhas, you get everything but prema. That's not bad, right? I mean, we want prema, but, you know, if you can get up to bhava, if you just get ruchi, that's fantastic. Once you get to ruchi, then just, you're on your way, you know. So I can, I can get to a, for quite a high state just by Namabhas. Now, here's the good news. After I give you the bad news, I will give you good news also. You're not just going to go home dep depressed today. How was the class, Prabhu? It was really bad. <laughs> All bad news. Uh, I think I'm going to sell my beads and give up because, you know, <laughs> sounds like I can't chant Hare Krishna. Yeah. Here's the good news. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur said that the Nam Abbas stage, which, in which Bhakti Vinod Thakur said you get all the benefits except prema, is achieved by making an effort to avoid the ten offenses, making an effort. He didn't even say by avoiding them, he said by making an effort, right? Because we know just because you make an effort doesn't mean you'll be successful, right? Because I'm trying to avoid, but may, and I'm trying my best, but you know, you know what it's like to control the mind. Sometimes there's inattention, it's an offense. But I'm trying to be attentive. So here's a beautiful story. You want to hear a story? Okay, turn to the devotee next to you and tell them, I want to hear this story. To tell the devotee next to you, I want to hear this story. Hello. Turn to the devotee next to you and tell them, I want to hear this story. I just want to make sure you're interested. Because you know. if you don't want to hear the story, you can go outside till I finish the story, and then you can come back in when I finish, right? Krishna, this vehicle MH12 EG 2391. ये सेंट्रो कार है इसको निकालना पड़ेगा सामने के प्लॉट में किसने रखा है उस प्लॉट का कुछ तो उनका आज पूजा करना है उधर पे उनको तो एम एच ट्वेल ई जी टू थ्री नाइन वन और कोई टू व्हीलर्स भी उस साइड है तो उनको निकालने पड़ेंगे कृपया करके किसी निकाले Was that just a trick and he's going to take a ride in his car because it's a nice car? <laughs> it's BMW, right? Okay. <laughs> so, Giriraj Swami told us this story. He was um, with Prabhupada. And he said, Prabhupada, sometimes I'm chanting and my mind is all over and I can't control it. He said, are you trying? And he said, yes, Prabhupada, I'm trying, but sometimes you try and you fail, right? Prabhupada said, no, then Giri Ashwami said, Srila Prabhupada, is it offensive because my mind is wandering? Because we think it's inattention, right? Distraction. Inattention means distraction. Actually, inattention just means you have your phone on, and that's enough to distract you, right? <laughs> right? I, I often say that if there was social media during the time that the Padma Purana was recorded, they would have included 11th offense, which was to have your phone on while you're chanting. <laughs> but um, some people say you can include it under distraction, and I agree that you maybe don't need a separate offense, but at least understand the offense of distraction is highly enhanced by having your phone on. What to speak of looking at it while you're chanting, right? So anyway, Prabhupada asked Giri Rashwami, are you trying? And he said, yes, Prabhupada, I'm trying, but still my mind is wandering. And Prabhupada said, if you are trying, it's not an offense. So that go, when we go back to what I just said, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta said, the effort 
to avoid the offenses. That is the Namabas stage. So you, you see this line of demarcation? I'm not trying to avoid the offenses. That's offensive. And I'm trying to avoid the offenses. It's Namabas. And everything comes from Namabas except Prema, and nothing but material piety comes from Namaparada. So there's no spiritual benefit. And so now, Srila Bhakti Vinod uh, Thakur said something very heavy. Are you ready for it? Are you, are you tough enough to hear it and take it and not run out of the temple? <laughs> okay, we'll see. I'm going to tell you. We'll see how many of you run out of the temple. He said, if I commit Nam Aparad, even though I chant 100 rounds every day, it's of no benefit. Right? So that confirms Nam Aparad only produces no spiritual benefit. Nam Aparad only produces material benefit. The only benefit of chanting is that maybe you'll get lucky and stop committing offenses because at least you're chanting, you know, so. You know, maybe after 300 lifetimes of Nam Maparad, some realization will come, mm, maybe I shouldn't chant Nam Maparad. So I have a story. Would you like to hear another story? Okay. Again, if you don't want to hear the story, you can go outside. And... Now, you're going to find this strange, but I think you you will appreciate what Prabhupada had to deal with in in his with his West trying to purify his Western disciples. This story is going to sound really weird to you, but Prabhupada had some disciples who left Iskon and created their own community. And in their community, they did not have a minimum of number of rounds. They were chanting, but there was no stricture that you had to chant a certain number, and they were not following four regulative principles. They were not following three regulative principles. They were only following two. And if you know anything about hippies, you can guess what two they were not following and what two they were following. Should I give you a hint? <laughs> or you already know? You know what it means to be a hippie, right? Sex, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. That's what it means to be hippie. So the sex and drugs were the two that they were following, or, or not, how should I say? Not following. Yeah. The two that, yeah, that's right. They were not following those, and the no gambling and no meat eating, they were following. I never knew, I mean, I knew those devotees, but I didn't know them after they started this community. And I could only assume that they just felt like they couldn't follow the other principles. But it's kind of strange, isn't it, that you would have a devotional, devotional community chanting Hare Krishna and drugs and illicit sex. It seems strange, doesn't it? So anyway, the GBC, the leader in that part of the world, talk to them about it, ask them questions, and he, they, they said, yes, we're not following the principles, but at least we're chanting Hare Krishna. That GBC went to Prabhupada, explained the whole situation, you have this community, they're chanting, they don't follow, only follow two principles, and they say that at least they're chanting Hare Krishna. And Prabhupada said something very heavy. Turn to the devotee next to you and say, what Mahaprabhu is going to tell you is going to be really heavy. <laughs> tell him. Are you ready to hear something heavy? Yes. And maybe this will shake us up to chant some good rounds from now in for here and ever after. 
So, they, so Srila Prabhupada, they say that even though they're not following their principles, still they're chanting Hare Krishna. Prabhupada said, maybe in 300 lifetimes that chanting will have some effect because what are they doing? Third offense to the holy name, disobeying the order of the guru. So I'm chanting, yes, you should chant, but I'm committing an offense. So I'm chanting, committing offense. What did Bhakti Siddhanta say? Krishna is not present in offensive chanting. Therefore, maybe after 300 lifetimes, something will happen. Well, you know, at least you're chanting, so there's, you know, it's like you're drowning in the water. As long as the water doesn't go above here, you can stay alive, right? So basically, okay, they're chanting. They're in the middle of the ocean, and the water's here, and they're just staying in the middle of the ocean. You know, Bhakti Vinod Thakur, he said, there's a kind of chanting where you're in the ocean and you're just dog paddling or what's the state? You're staying afloat, but you're not going anywhere. Okay, so, you know, I'm still chanting. And, and what he said was much better than these devotees. He said, yeah, you're following regulative principles and you're chanting, but you're ch chanting properly. So you're just staying afloat, but you're not going anywhere. You know, you're, you're getting the benefit of chanting only to the point where it helps you follow principles, but not to the point where it's really awakening your love of Krishna. That's interesting, isn't it? So, what we learn from this is very important for us. <clears throat> the first principle I want you to get, and I want you to get this deeply in your heart, <clears throat> and I think it's obvious from this discussion, all chanting is not the same. All 16 rounds are not the same. And we think, well, if you're, if you're initiated or you want to be initiated or you're living in the temple or um, you've, you've made a commitment to chant 16 rounds, we've heard Prabhupada say many times, if you chant 16 rounds and follow the four principles, you will go back to Godhead in this life. He said it many times. He was questioned about it. People doubt it. Gaudiya Math says no, three lifetimes. It's impossible, one lifetime. Just this morning, I was reading, I was reading um, a lecture on the Dvaita Acharya. Sri Dvaita Acharya Prabhu Ki Jai. I was reading a lecture this morning on the Dvaita Acharya. <clears throat> and in the lecture, Prabhupada was saying, we, we should go back to Godhead in this lifetime. If you take the Krishna consciousness, you can go back to Godhead in this lifetime. That's the goal. You should do it, etc., etc. And so Prabhupada had this theme, go back to Godhead in this lifetime, one life, don't, don't come back for another life, don't spend another life. <clears throat> and many times Prabhupada said, Kali Yuga is bad, it's going to be so bad, don't come back, you won't want to be here. He, he was like encouraging us. You know, somehow or other, he was trying to knock sense in us, you know, because we have, you know the word thick-headed? You have children that are thick-headed, whatever you tell them, it's just... It just kind of, it's, their heads are so thick, it doesn't get in, right? So we're spiritually thick-headed. And so over and over and over again, Prabhupada would say, you can do it in this life, do it in this life, you don't have to come back, you can get it done now, just do it. And it's going to get really bad and you don't want to come back. And so do yourself a favor, chant Hare Krishna, 16 rounds, and you will go back to Godhead. So once I heard that, I was like, this is good. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna, Hare Krishna. 16 rounds, I go back to God. Hare Krishna. Where's my phone? You got a phone? Hare Krishna. This is, this is great, you know. Watch videos and chant. Just got to do 16 rounds. Hare Krishna. <laughs> yeah? Okay, you don't have to say anything, but I'm going to ask the question. Have you ever done this before? I don't want to embarrass anyone. I'm just asking the question. You can answer it silently to yourself. So this is a huge misunderstanding, isn't it? If I just chant 16 rounds, I can go back to Godhead. No, that's not what Prabhupada meant. If Prabhupada meant you could chant any old kind of 16 rounds, then wow, 
you know. Just, you know, get up early, do the high-speed japa, you know, take an ice-cold bath and, you know, just get going, you know. You know, in an hour and five minutes you can finish and like, wow, cool, I'm going back to Godhead, now I can do anything I want today. <laughs> right, you know, you know that mentality? Got my rounds done, I'm good. Got my insurance policy, you know. It's, I, I'm paid every day, I pay 16, 16 rounds into my insurance policy, I'm good. Yeah, the problem is, you're paying your insurance agency with counterfeit money. And he's like, you know, and you, you go to cash in your insurance policy, and he said, you've been paying me with counterfeit money. You have no policy. <laughs> now you tell me at the end of my life, you know. So most of you are kind of young, so it's good you know now, right, that you can't, you know, have an insurance policy with counterfeit money. Have you ever heard this concept of the shadow of a name? It's not the real name, it's a shadow. You know, I mean, that's what boss means. But nama boss, it doesn't mean a shadow in the sense that there's no, there's no potency. It means there is something there. It's not a complete shadow. It's, it's just not the full. It's not the full light, it's a partial. That's what it means. Not a shadow, but there's the concept of a shadow. Right? So. If you're trying to lose weight, I have a plan for you. You can eat anything you want. This is a great plan. You're like, wow, really? You can eat anything? Yeah, you can eat anything you want. This is how you do it. You get a light above your dining table, and then you get um, some wires to hold your plate and hang your plate, and you shine a light, and the shadow goes on the table, and you just eat the shadow and you'll lose a lot of weight, and you get to eat anything you want. What do you think? Good idea? How does the shadow taste? Okay, I have another question for you. Does your holy name ever taste like a shadow? Like, did you ever have this experience of like, Krishna's in his holy name, I've read that, I've heard that, but I'm chanting now and I have like zero realization. You ever had that experience? Prabhu, I had a big realization today in my japa. What was it? That I have no realization. <laughs> that was my big realization today. I have no realization that Krishna is in his name. Have you ever had that realization? Oh yeah, Prabhu, I have it all the time, very intensely. It's a very intense realization for me during japa. So there's this concept of a shadow name, right? So if you're not, you're, if, you, if you eat, <clears throat> if you follow my diet after three or four days, you're going to be like really weak and tired, right? Because you're only eating a shadow of your food. Have you ever felt like spiritually weak? That ever happened to anybody here? It's just like... You know, you know that you know that kind of day when you just like <laughs> Maya's really strong. You know that you know you know that day, like you just feel it, like you know deep inside you. Wow, Maya's really heavy. You know what that means, my dear devotees. That means you have just eaten for breakfast sixteen shadow rounds of japa. Because if you actually chant 16 proper rounds, you will never say, Maya is strong. You will say, I don't know where Maya's gone. I haven't seen her for weeks. That's what you'll say. Every day you'll chant a good round. You, Maya's like, she's like, this guy's useless. I can't do anything for him. I'll go next, to, I'll go to the devotee in the next room, right? <laughs> He's chanting Namaparad. We can deal with him. We can work with him. This devotee I can't work with because he's like, Hari Krishna, Hari Krishna, Krishna. Like, how do I get into that devotee? He's sitting with Krishna. Like, there's no room for me. So every time you're, you have this realization that Maya is strong, it probably means you were eating, you were chanting shadow japa. Right? Should we make a t-shirt? 
down with shadow japa. No more shadow japa. Yeah. Because if we actually chant the holy name properly, we are going to, you know, Param Vijayate Sri Krishna Sankirtan. You know, it's like you read Param Vijayate Sri Krishna Sankirtan and you don't feel like Param Vijayate. You don't feel like the opposite. What would the opposite be in Sanskrit? Ajayate? No, no jayate, no jayate, no jayate. Ajayate, Sri Krishna Sankirtan. I feel like Maya Jayate. Param Vijayate, Maya Devi, Sankirtan on me, yeah. So, um, you have to judge. You can't pretend I'm chanting and feeling empty, like, hello, if you're chanting, if you're with Krishna and you're feeling empty, maybe, just maybe, it's possible Krishna wasn't there and you just thought he was, right? So, now we go back to Prabhupada's statement. Chant 16 rounds and follow four principles. Okay, what kind of rounds? What kind of rounds do you have to chant to go back to Godhead in this lifetime? I, I once had this experience. It was funny. I was, I was traveling and I, uh, we were chanting in the morning and I was really tired. And if I'm like really, really tired, I can't chant with the other devotees because, because there's noise, not noise, there's the holy names being chanted by all the devotees. So you have to chant loud enough to hear. And if I'm really tired, I can't even... I'm like, Hare Krishna, Hare. I gotta like just whisper. So I, I went and chanted in my room, kind of like this, Hare Krishna, Hare. You know, what I called it lazy japa. But then I realized that I was producing a lazy Krishna. Because Krishna's, well, Prabhu, how's, how's your Krishna? You know that Krishna you're producing? How's he doing today? Uh, he was feeling kind of lazy. <laughs> he was. My, the Krishna I was producing was quite, kind of tired today and distracted. And uh, he wasn't really happy, you know, hanging out with me. You know? So I was just in my mind thinking, oh, if I'm producing Krishna, <clears throat> what kind of Krishna am I producing if I'm even producing anything? So anyway, when Prabhupada initiated devotees, he initiated devotees and he said, the Ten Offenses, and he told us whenever there's an initiation that you should recite the Ten Offenses. Now, let's put two and two together. It's an initiation into Harinam. You're taking a vow. With this vow of 16 rounds, four principles, which you're vowing to follow, Prabhupada's saying you vow to do this, and you, and you um, will go back to Godhead. Okay. But... Prabhupada is qualifying it. What's he qualifying it? These are the ten offenses. Don't make them. So that is the pramanam, that is the evidence that you can't just chant any kind of rounds and think you're going back to Godhead because if Krishna is not even in your holy name or Krishna is falling asleep in your holy name and if you're not even there while you're chanting... That's not the chanting that Prabhupada is saying is going to take you back to Godhead. It's not any chanting. It's actual chanting. <clears throat> Does that make sense? Okay, we have a problem. You want to hear the problem? <clears throat> it's good we address this problem. You remember I said that to teach something well, you have to isolate what the problem is. And this problem after teaching japa for so many years this problem became obvious to me and how did i understand this problem through the questions the audience was asking and i will tell you the questions they're asking and maybe you've had these questions also and you will see what these questions reveal is that they're looking at the holy name as a external physical process you you have to do it. Like sit this way, pronounce it this way, face this direction, do this, do that. Right? It's, 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 um, the focus is not on connecting with Krishna, but it's connecting through physical aspects of chanting. And that, that is actually the biggest problem we all face. And I'm not saying 
these things are not, you have to pronounce properly, you have to hear, sit, all these things are important. But what I saw is that's all that was important. That was like of primary importance. So we got questions like, is it okay to stand up when I chant? Okay, so is it okay to give your mother a hug when you're standing or do you have to be sitting? It's like the same question. It's like, wouldn't you think that's a stupid question? You know, go home and hug your mother. Prabhu, what time of day is the best for hugging your mother? <laughs> if I hug her after 7.30, will she still accept it? Should I do it standing or sitting? Should we be facing east when we hug? <laughs> like, that's ridiculous, isn't it? You'd think. You, if anybody said that, you would think, it's probably a little mentally ill, right? <laughs> Wouldn't you? Like, that's not normal. <laughs> Is it okay to stand up? Can I chant after 7.30? How long should it chant, take to chant the holy name? What direction should I sit? This is all process questions, right? When you understand that you're connecting with Krishna when you chant, it's a relationship, then those process questions start to sound like not so important. Just like, just hug your mother, it doesn't matter. Just show her you love her. You haven't seen her in a year. Just do it as Admit, do it at midnight, it doesn't matter. Just do it, right? With love and devotion, right? So when you understand the holy name, <clears throat> the relationship we have with the holy name is, is similar, if not exactly the same, to relationships we have in this world, then you understand my focus on the process is, is I, missed, I missed something. I missed the essence, right? Okay, Hug your mother at exactly 7.32 and 14 seconds, facing, facing south by southwest, 36 degrees, right? Hug her for exactly 14 seconds. And at 14 seconds, exactly tell her you love her, and then hold her hand and kiss it at 17 and a half seconds. You would think, I am nuts, right? What are you talking about? This is crazy. Right? If you love your mother, do you even need any instruction how to do that? No, you do it out of love, right? All these japa workshops and all the principles and everything, it came out of the love of the heart of the senior devotees who love to chant, and they're sharing the realizations of what it's like when you love to chant. And this problem, I hate to say it, this problem is most um, this, is, this problem affects mostly Indians in the West or in India because you've been raised process-oriented, as far as I can tell. Like, you know, go to the temple, see the god, offer the, you know, seven times or whatever you do. Why are you doing that? I don't know. That's what my grandmother told me to do. Isn't it? Something like that. Yes? So, I'm not faulting you. It's good, you know, to be process-oriented is good because you can follow things and you can do it well. That's good. But when it's a relationship, it's not good because that's not what... The process is just secondary, right? But the connection, the relationship is primary. Does that make sense? So this is really an obstacle I want you all to meditate on and maybe... You were raised, you know, going to temples and doing puja and offering this and doing rituals, which is, I'm not putting that down, but it definitely can create a samskar where the rituals become important. And therefore, we have the smarta brahman, right? It's not about bhakti, it's about doing the ritual, right? You want to hear a funny story? This is, this is such a good story. It's one of my favorite stories about the holy name. So, as you know, as foreigners and Americans, we're not really like fantastic in pronouncing Sanskrit, you know, because you, you know Hindi, so you know, you just know Sanskrit just by, you know, more or less, you know how it should be pronounced because it's almost the same, many words, right? So the Americans come and completely destroy the pronunciations, right? <laughs> and you're sitting in class and they're reading the verse and you're like, oh my God, this is like, this is... 
Anyway, you respect them so you don't say anything, but you know they're pronouncing it wrong, right? So all the American disciples, or you know, in India in the early days with Prabhupada and the chanting, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. And there's a Sanskritist, you know, that's with Prabhupada and the devotees, and he's going crazy, as you could imagine, you know. It's Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. That's right, right? More or less. Maybe even you don't do it that way, but that's... <laughs> that's more or less the proper way to do it, right? So even in India, depending on the part of India and the accent, you know, if you're Bengali, you really botch it up, right? Kisno. <laughs> and Prabhupada, the Kisno Ramo, and Prabhupada, you know, he can be very funny. He Prabhupada's like, who is this Ramo? <laughs> I, I don't know. Who are they? Who's Ramo? You know? Who is this Ramo? They're talking? Who is this Kisno? <laughs> right? So even, you know, and Lord Chaitanya used to make fun did you know that? He used to make fun of the, the accent, you know, the Bengali accent. I don't know how he made fun of it, but it's, you know, it's funny, right? Shit down, Prabhu. <laughs> That's funny, you know. But I usually do that on the toilet. I don't do it, you know. You know, so he could imagine Mahaprabhu's, you know, having fun, you know. Anyway, so this story is so beautiful. So... <laughs> He says to Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada, ye, these devotees are chanting the holy name improperly. And Prabhupada says, yes, I know. Like Prabhupada didn't know. Like Prabhupada's translating Bhagavatam, he knows Sanskrit, he knows how to pronounce Krishna's name. And Prabhupada, I never heard Prabhupada try to correct us. Hare Krishna, all the devotees, Hare Rama. We're going on Hari Nam Sankirtan. And Prabhupada never said, it is not Hare Krishna, it's Hare Krishna, and it's Sankirtan. Hare Nam Sankirtan. He never said, ever, corrected us. And Prabhupada told this man, he said, yes, I know, but Krishna knows who they're calling. Wow. If that, if that doesn't destroy every ounce of ritualistic mentality you have left in your heart, I don't know what will. <laughs> You've got any smart to blood in you, you know, this, it's, it's over. It's over for you. You can pronounce a mantra completely wrong and go back to Godhead. Wow. If you're a smart to, I don't know, that's it. You probably want to commit suicide now, right? Because <laughs> the smart is all about pronunciation, right? and do it properly at the right time in the right way with the right ritual. Yes? Right? When you see the South Indians and they're chanting their Om Purnamada Purnamidang You know, it's like, wow. I'm like, whoa. Are they creating a Brahmastra or what are they doing, you know? <laughs> they're like, they get one syllable wrong, they're going to blow up, right? <laughs> Isn't it? So, my dear devotees, I heard it was a pious birth to be born in India, but you have to contend with this problem, you know, because it works against you when you chant Hare Krishna. You're chanting, you're not even pronouncing it properly, but Krishna knows that you're trying to chant his name. What does that mean? That means the heart and the intention is much more important than the external. I mean, what could be more clear than that story? You agree? I mean, that's an amazing story. You, know, you botched up the holy name. You pronounce it totally wrong. And Prabhupada's saying, Krishna sees what's in your heart, right? So, when we're chanting, we're offering our heart. We're praying. What are we praying for? I want to be a pure devotee. I don't want to be a conditioned soul. That's what chanting is all about. It's about giving Krishna your heart. It's not about getting 16 rounds done. It's not about being a smart japa chanter. You should be a smart japa chanter, but not a smart japa chanter. It's about the heart. So bhakti is all about the heart. Patra pushpam palam toyam. Okay, is it about the fruit? Is it about the flower? Is it about the water? Is it about the leaf? 
No. What's it about? Bhakti Uparitam. It's about the bhakti, right? The fruit, flower, leaf, or what? It doesn't matter. Offer whatever. It's the bhakti that's important, right? So, should I chant at 4, 4.35, sitting this direction? Is this okay? Can I stand up? Can I walk? It's not about the fruit, flower, leaf, or water. It's about the bhakti. Isn't that obvious? I mean, it's a relationship, right? You ask any woman, if your husband totally ignores you, you talk to him and he's just got cotton in his ears, he doesn't want anything to do with you, but he gives you a beautiful house, a beautiful car, all the jewelry and saris you could ever want. Are you, ha are you happy? And they're like, not really. I mean, I like the house and the car and the saris, but I'm not really satisfied because we don't have a relationship. Am I correct? 100%, right? So that's like, you know, you can give Krishna the perfect mantra and the perfect ritual and the perfect everything. That's like, like husbands, um, they say men are more intelligent. I don't know. They're not that intelligent when it comes to marriage, right? Because they think, well, I'll make my wife happy by giving her stuff. She's happy by having a good relationship, not just by, ha I mean, she likes stuff, of course. But she's happy having the relationship. Krishna is the same way. You can't buy him through ritual. You buy him through bhakti. Right? Does that make sense? So, another car is blocking the driveway. This one more car, uh, MH14 HD 1862. MH14 HD 1862. It's in the lane. Please remove. Red color model. Mm -hmm. So, I want to add, I'm going to give you a new verse from Bhagavad Gita. This is from chapter 19. <laughs> I, you know, I like to create new verses. I like to add, you know, it's like, it's dynamic, you know, spiritual life is dynamic, you know. Why not create verses which apply? Patra pushpam palam toyam toyam nama. Yome Bhakta Prayachiti. Let's add the holy name to that verse. Because is it any different? Because every day we're offering Krishna what? The holy name. So how should we offer it? With what? Bhakti. Patra Pushpam Balam Toyam Nama Yome Bhakta Prayachiti. Tadaham Bhakta Paritam. Then I will accept it. Of one who has a pure heart, Prayatatmanaha. I will accept that offering from that person. Now, Prabhupada said something heavy. Are you strong enough to hear something heavy? Yes. We'll find out. Prabhupada said, if you don't make an offering with devotion, Krishna kicks that offering off your altar. Whoa. Hare Krishna. Okay. If that's true, and I'm making an offering, leaf, flower, fruit or, fruit, or water. But this time, it's not leaf, flower, fruit, or water. I'm making an offering of nam. And I'm offering nam without bhakti. What does Krishna do with that nam? You can take it. Keep it yourself. I don't want your nam. It's not even, you know, it's like... Do you ever feel like you feel nothing when you chant? You ever have that feeling? How are you feeling, Prabhu? Not feeling. Okay, this is really interesting. And this is so simple. Krishna says, Yeyatamam prapadyante. I reciprocate with whatever you offer me. My dear devotees, if you're feeling nothing when you're chanting and Krishna is equally reciprocating with you, what are you offering him? You don't have to be a mathematician to know. If you offer zero in an investment, you get back how much on your investment? Zero. So <laughs> whenever you say, I don't feel anything, hello, I don't feel Krishna's reciprocation. Hello, you made a zero investment and you're waiting for a big return. Does that make sense? I invested zero. <laughs> 
I don't feel anything. Trying off, try offering something. Krishna, please let me be your pure devotee. Please help me. Please purify me. Try making that offering and you will get a reciprocation. But even more simple than that is when you make that offering, immediately you have an emotional experience because you're feeling the bhakti that you're offering through the holy name because you get to experience your own bhakti, right? So, my dear devotees, we get to experience our own bhakti. How much bhakti do you give to your japa? Because that's what you're experiencing. So if you say... I don't feel anything when I chant. That's autobiographical. You have just said, I put nothing to my japa. I, my japa, I'm a dead stone. My heart is like stone. If you say I feel nothing, you're admitting that your heart is like a stone. You're chanting stone-hearted japa. Yes? Because if you put the bhakti in, what do you feel? You feel, the own bhakti. You feel your own bhakti that you put in. Krishna, please, let me serve you. Let me love you. Please accept me. Please take my heart. P please, please pick me up from the ocean of material existence. Hare Krishna. And you're feeling that. You can't say, I have no experience with chanting because you're feeling what you're feeling. You can only say, I don't feel anything. It's not that Krishna is not reciprocating. Or you could say, He is. He's reciprocating with nothing. So, what do you expect? I, I, um, yeah, so we should say, if you feel nothing in your japa, understand Krishna is 100% reciprocating with your nothing. <laughs> zero times zero is still zero. He's reciprocating, but I, but, 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 Prabhu, it says Krishna takes one step. You take one step to Krishna, he takes ten to you. Okay, we'll take this first step. When you don't make the step and you're waiting for the reciprocation, you don't get any, right? <laughs> it's zero. I didn't take it. Why isn't, um, why isn't Krishna reciprocating? He is. He's reciprocating with Nama Parad. He's 100% reciprocating with your Nama Parad. There is no bhakti in your Nama Parad. There's just offenses, so distraction, laziness, apathy. Krishna is reciprocating with our distraction, laziness, and apathy. Have you ever had that experience? 100% reciprocation with nothing equals nothing. Hare Krishna. It's true, isn't it? I hate to be so honest and straightforward, but I have to be, because we have to extract laziness, apathy, and distraction. We have to get rid of that. And you might say, how do we get rid of all these things? How do we stop making offenses? It's really simple. We just offer our holy name with devotion. That destroys all the offense because where there's devotion, there can't be offense. They're like two opposite things. You know, how do we get rid of the dark? Oh, just turn the light on. That was easy, right? You can't get rid of the light by bringing in a, a bottle of dark but you can get rid of the dark by bringing in a bottle of light, right? So where there is a light of the holy name and that light is devotion, there won't be any offenses automatically. So what time are we supposed to end? Or we go forever because there's no prasadam today? <laughs> what was the schedule? 7.30 to 9. 7.30 to 9. Okay, so 7.30 to 9 and what? Okay, so we go a little later. We'll have questions, yeah. Um, so this is an important point to remember. It's not a ritual. When I chant, it's not a ritual. The goal is not 16 rounds. The goal is not, you know, sit perfectly, pronounce perfectly, hear perfectly. We should do that, but that's not the goal. That's not the end game. That's smarta. Smarta, the end game is the process, right? Isn't it? Perfect execution of the process. For bhakti, it's perfect execution of the heart. It's all bhakti, right? I offer my holy name with bhakti. So think of your chanting just like you're offering to the deity. That same mood when you put that boga on the plate and you say, Krishna, please accept this. I'm unqualified. 
I have no bhakti, I have nothing, but I'm asking you, please accept this. That same mood, Hare Krishna, Krishna, please accept me. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. I'm useless, I'm rotten, whatever. Uh, nothing good about me, but I want to be a pure devotee. I want to love you, and I want to serve my guru by, by avoiding the offenses. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram. That's japa, that's real japa. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Now, there's something interesting. If this were a class on kirtan, I wouldn't have to say any of this. Because what do we do when we chant kirtan? Hare Krishna. Isn't it? All emotion. All prayer. Yes? This, this class would be totally irrelevant for kirtan, don't you think? It's like automatic. When you sing... You just automatically pray, you open your heart. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. It's like, you know, it's like you're praying, you know, Krishna, come down and just take me out of here, isn't it? Just lift my heart. So that's how we feel when we do kirtan, isn't it? Isn't that interesting? I'm going to tell you something amazingly profound that you've probably never discovered in a million lifetimes. Are you ready for it? You know the Maha Mantra that we chant in Kirtan? Here's the profound truth. That's the same Maha Mantra you chant in Japa. <laughs> wow, Prabhu, thank you for telling me that. That was the deepest truth I've ever heard in my life. Do you mean that's the same mantra? The, but, but that's the one that puts me to sleep in Japa and it's the one that makes me dance in Kirtan. How could that be the same mantra? Well, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's not the same. Maybe that mantra in kirtan is a different mantra than the one in japa because the japa one's putting you to sleep and the kirtan one's making you dance. It's the same mantra, but it's not the same mantra. If it were, we would feel that same emotion, right? So, you can have the same emotional experience that you have with kirtan with japa. That's good news, isn't it? Turn to the devotee next to you and say, Prabhu, that's really good news. I think that's good news, don't you? Yes? I think it's great news, right? How do you have that experience? Because when you're approaching the holy name with Japa, you're praying, Krishna, please, and fill in the blank, whatever you're praying for. But it's some variety of, help me become a pure devotee, right? And you look at the Shishastakam, if you look at the verses of Shishastakam, there's so many prayers in there, right? You're so merciful, you know, just appreciating Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, you're so merciful, Hare Krishna. Let me appreciate your name. I'm so unfortunate. Let me stop committing offenses. Please help me. Uh, I don't want anything. Please help me to not want anything. Please help me to just want pure bhakti, Hare Krishna. That's japa. And then you'll have the same experience. Now, I'm going to say something which could be revolutionary. I say you can have a uniquely sweet experience from japa that you could never get in kirtan. Oh, would you like to hear? Think about it. In kirtan, we're in a room, like how many, how many devotees are here? Like 80 or something or whatever, 100? We had kirtan this morning with a hundred devotees. So that's nice. It's nice to be with devotees, right? So it was the holy name. It was me and a hundred devotees, right? Japa is you, the holy name, and Krishna, and that's it. It's just you and Krishna. It's just, that's all it is, isn't it? It's personal. It's private. It's intimate. It's sweet. Yes? 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 You're all like, huh, I never experienced that. <laughs> really? It's intimate and sweet? Uh, yeah, it is, yeah. When you chant properly, you will have the realization that I am sitting with Krishna. It's just me and Krishna. I mean, everyone else is chanting. They have their Krishna, and I have my Krishna, right? So when you're chanting japa, 
You have your Krishna, your Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. That's yours. It's not mine. I don't have yours. I have, I'm creating mine, Hare Krishna. When we're doing kirtan, we have the same Krishna. When we're doing japa, we have we uniquely our own Krishna, we're, which we're creating every moment when we say Hare Krishna. So it's just you and Krishna alone. Even there's a 10,000 devotees in the temple. It's you and your relation with Krishna. Is that sweet? Or is that sweet? Turn to the devotee next to you and tell them, that is sweet. So now, here's the bad news. You can lament for all those times you chanted japa like a smarta brahman and you didn't realize it was sweet and you weren't praying for pure bhakti, you were only praying to get your rounds done without going crazy or killing yourself. You ever had that one? Krishna just helped me get my rounds done before I jump out the window. Yes? You've ever had japa like that? We, sh we should call it out the window japa. You know? I don't know what's first, 16 rounds or me jumping out the window, but I hope it's the 16 rounds, so I'm really praying to you, Krishna, that I just I don't go crazy in boredom when I chant my rounds. Yeah, That is not japa. That means Krishna is not present in your japa. He's completely gone, and you are only trying to chant a number because you made a promise, right? But what's actually going on is this intimate, sweet relationship where you can offer your bhakti to Krishna in complete devotion, and it's just you and him. Now, let's take the next 10 minutes, let's take the next minute, and we can all cry, all right? On the count of 10, I want you to cry. And you can think, wow, if that's what japa is, I've really been missing out, okay? On the count of 10, start crying. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And just lament that I missed that opportunity. In so many sessions of japa, I missed it. I was with Krishna and I didn't realize it. And I wasn't giving him my heart. I was just giving him a ritualistic 16 rounds. We should lament, right? And so from now on, in the future, in your life, you can have this sweet relationship with Krishna every day if you make the effort. You remember how we began this class? Trying to avoid the offenses is not offensive. That's namabhas. We have to try. And what is the biggest offense? Distraction, inattention, laziness, apathy. Right? Okay, so it's, I'm going to end soon. But I have to do something because this is really important. Have you ever chanted, and it sounds something like this? Yes? You ever chant like that? If you don't realize this, you have chanted that way, you just don't notice it. And I can prove it to you. It's just turn on record on your phone when you chant japa for two hours. And, you know, you don't want to listen to the two hours, but if you skimp through, you will come to a point where it's going to sound like... You agree? You've been there, done that? Yeah. Okay. What does the holy name mean? Krishna, please engage me in your service, right? You want to be a pure devotee, and this is what you're communi communicating to Krishna. Please engage me in your service, service, please engage me in your service. I want you to give me your service. Yeah. Yeah, give me some service, service, yeah, I want to give you service. <laughs> so, oh, Radha, uh, Rad, uh, give me some service, Krishna, give me some service, Radha, uh, some service, service. Uh, service. <laughs> You know, I'm just, I'm just being straightforward. That's actually what's happening, right? Yes? And then we go out in the world and we work really hard to get success, to make, become upward mobility, get a better position in our company, make more money, get a bigger house, bigger car. And we're fired up. You know, we work hard 10 hours a day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we chant our rounds. That's weird, isn't it? Don't you think? 
Now, if you ever chant like this and you're actually praying, it looks something like Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare O Krishna, please engage me in your service, please help me, please pick me up out of this ocean of material existence, Hare Krishna, place me as an atom at your lotus feet, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, right? That's what the Maha Mantra means, so say it like you mean it. You, you're supposed to mean, Krishna, please pick me up. Say it like you mean it. You're supposed to ask Krishna for pure, pure bhakti. When you chant, say it like you mean it. Don't say it like it's just a ritual to get done. And Krishna's looking at you and he's thinking, oh my God, look at this loser. <laughs> look at this loser. <laughs> He's been in the material world forever. He has a chance in this life to go back to God and uh, look at this poor God. <laughs> yes? What do you think? You know, and you know, what does Krishna feel about your chanting? He feels the same thing that you feel. Nothing. So that's the problem. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much. Um, you learn more when you laugh, so I wanted to guarantee you would learn more, so I made you laugh. So we have time for questions, or what's the program? Okay, so we have, um, and you know why I make devotees laugh? Because I read, we just have to pull the, the mic a little bit this way. I read, I don't know where I read it, maybe someone knows where this is. If you make devotees laugh, you make spiritual advancement. Because you're pleasing a devotee. So you, know, you do something to please a devotee, you make advancement. And so one way you can please a devotee is make them laugh. But if you can make them laugh and learn at the same time, that's even better. Okay, someone has, yes, yes. Thank you, Mara, so much for the very enlightening discussion. My question is uh, about this battle which goes on uh, in uh, completing the rounds and the services we have to take through the day. Mm -hmm. So then many a times I end up doing the in the evening ritualistic japa sometimes yeah. to pace it up or mm -hmm. then it goes later in the evening. Yeah, yeah. What to do about it? Yeah, means <clears throat> I'm not going to tell you what to do, but I'm going to tell you something else, and then you can determine. I have a theory. I'm competing with Newton. I have a theory about time. You want to hear it? And I didn't good, do good in science. science. Maybe I got a B in science or something. So, But my theory of time is that time expands and time contracts according to what you give priority to, what you like to do. Because Prabhupada was told by a devotee, I don't have time to finish my rounds. And Prabhupada just asked, do you have time to eat and do you have time to sleep? Of course, the devotee embarrassingly said yes. So Prabhupada was making the point, time opens up, maybe expands, yeah, expands can be a good word. Time expands according to your priorities. Maybe I should write a book and get famous, you know, and go on TED and, you know, just talk about time expands when you give something priority. And time, so you know that, you know that feeling, I can never find time to do blank, right? And what's the blank? It's the thing you don't want to do, generally. It's, or at least it's the thing that you didn't give priority to. Right? So, this question that you have plagues many devotees. <clears throat> I have, especially Grihastas, I have children, I have job, this, that. 
It's really difficult to find time. So, so many devotees, after they did a japa retreat, like six days with the holy name, all day, just learning about the holy name, going deeper, 64 rounds. When they came back from that japa retreat, everybody started giving much more priority, not just to good chanting, but just chanting, like both, like really giving the holy name priority. And everybody had this amazing realization. They said, when I give priority, it seems like I always have time to finish my rounds and do them well. And when I don't give it priority, it always seems like I'll do it later. You're, so here are your beads. Your new name is, I'll do it later, Dasa. <laughs> My daughter would often say, do not trust your future self. And what is that future self? I'll do it later. Don't trust, I'll do it later, right? But that's the predicament of not giving something priority. And that's why Prabhupada was just trying to make a very simple point. Obviously, eating is a priority. Obviously, sleeping is a priority. Therefore, we make time for it. You make time for what's important. So this was really strange because our, our schedules were the same, but we had more, seemingly, we had more time for japa just by a shift in consciousness. So it's like, that's my theory. Time opens up when your consciousness shifts. When the focus shifts, you find time for it. When it's not a focus, you don't find time for it. And maybe it's good you don't focus on some things because maybe it's good to not find time because they're not important. And you don't give it importance, you tend not to find time. So that's my answer to you. But you were looking for another answer, or is that, is that okay? Okay. Yeah, I think that's a more fundamental answer. Because I could give you some practical advice, but... Um, well, I'll give you some other practical... Another, another thing that happened, and this is quite interesting. If you try to employ what I was teaching today, and we have two more sessions, so we'll go more deeply. If you try to employ it, you will have a different experience with the holy name. The, the ritualist experience, it's like, it's like I knew a couple, they were devotee couples, and they, they got into a, they had a problem, and they stopped talking to one another, and they lived in a very small house, and they never spoke. But they would never get divorced. And I thought, this is just like 16 bad rounds. I'll never stop chanting 16 bad rounds. I'll never give it up. You know, I'll never talk to my wife ever again, and I'll never get divorced. It's a true story. I don't know if they're talking today. This was like 20 years ago. You know, I have to ask them next time I see them. Have you spoken to your wife in the last 20 years? No, probably not. But we're still married. Great, great. <laughs> I chant 16 rounds every day, and they're really bad. Oh, congratulations, Prabhu. So, um, so what the other experience we had was, if you do what I say, then you'll, you'll start talking to your wife again. You know, it's like, here, just, just do this, say this thing. That relationship will start to become sweeter. And as it becomes sweeter, you want to talk more because you're, you're relishing it. It's good. You know, the heart is melting and the affection is coming up. So if you have, if you apply these principles, you'll have good experiences, right? And then you'll start to think, this is so sweet, and the sweetest time to do this is early in the morning, so I don't want to miss the sweetness of this japa by having to do it later because it's harder and it's not always as sweet. So naturally, what happens? Priority gets plugged into your brain for early morning. And people always say, how do you get up early in the morning? It's so hard. I'm not an early morning person. I'm a night person. I'm this and that. My mother couldn't get up before noon. I inherited her genes, you know, all of that. 
And there's, there is truth to a lot of that. There is. Some, some devotees don't need to sleep a lot, and others need to sleep more. And others, if you just say the word early morning, they go into trauma. Right? You just, you just think of early mornings. It's like, you know, it's like a horror movie early. And, but if you have these beautiful experiences with the holy name, especially early in the morning, that heals that early morning trauma because like, this is so sweet. I, be, I don't want to miss that. I want to be up for it. And a lot of people that aren't up in the early in the morning, I've noticed they're not up because they don't have that experience with the holy name. So there's really nothing to get up for except your miserable life, right? You got to face the world another day. So let's just stay in bed longer because, you know, I don't like to chant Hare Krishna. And if I get out of bed early, that means I have to start chanting. So better stay in bed. Yes? Does that make sense? That's what's actually going on subconsciously for some of us. Why don't you want to get up early? Because I have to chant Hare Krishna early. <laughs> Isn't that weird? But the opposite is true. So if you have sweet experiences with the holy name and you start thinking, you know, it'd probably be sweeter early in the morning, and you start getting up earlier, then it'll be... I'm going to get up late because I'm going to miss that time where I have this sweet connection with Krishna. But if it's all ritualistic and boring and just get your rounds done, you know, jump out the window or finish my rounds, I had, a, I had an experience, and I think you've had this also. Um, I went through a period of chanting really bad rounds, and I, I didn't, I don't know what to do or why I was doing it. I think I was too busy, and it was like, I was so busy, and I think I was traveling a lot, and I had to get a million things done. And you, you, ever, you ever have that day when there's not enough hours to get everything done, and like the next day you got to go somewhere, and it's like, ah! And it's like you pick up your beads and like, I wish I didn't have to chant today because I can't even get everything done even if I had 26 hours. I think it was like, it was like that. And I, I couldn't chant properly. And so every time I was chanting, it was like, can I jump out the window now and end this misery? It was like that, you know? So one morning after chanting like three days in a row, really poor rounds, I stuck my hand in my bead bag and this thought came to me. As soon as I touched the bead, this thought came to me. And the thought was this. Oh no, here we go again. And I promise you, you've all had that thought. You may not have known it consciously, but think about it. Have you ever put your hand in your bead bag and all of a sudden it went like this? Like your energy just went down. You know, you're all like, Haribo Prabhu, every, yeah, yeah, Hare Krishna, you know, Tosi Bharani Kiji, and then, uh. yes? It's the, oh no, here we go again. It's another session of bad japa. After years of bad japa, like, I really don't want to do it. Guru Maharaj, can we change the number? Can, you know, is there some Shastra, you know, four is as good as 16, you know? His spiritual world is unlimited, and four is 16, 16 is four. You know, is there some verse like that? I'm praying every day, find that verse, you know? <laughs> So, um, but I have another experience, and, and, and we're going to get one of these two experiences. When you chant well every day, then when your hand touches the beads, it's like, ah, it changes. It's positive. It's, it's like, ah, nectar. I'm with Krishna. Let's do this. So, my dear devotees, we are going to have one of these two experiences. We're going to have the, oh no, here we go again. Or we're going to have the, oh yeah, this is nectar experience. And you are the ones who are going to be the determinant factor of what experience you will have by how you apply proper chanting of the holy name, avoiding the ten offenses, putting the bhakti and offering these names with devotion is going to determine your experience. And I can guarantee you, if you don't do it well, you're going to have this negative experience the rest of your life. And it's not. And your relationship with the holy name is going to be negative, which means it's a negative relationship with Krishna. If your relationship, if you think japa, like, uh, I like kirtan, but not japa, that's a negative relationship with Krishna. You know? Right? Uh... 
I like my sister, I don't like my wife. It's like the same thing. I like Hirtan, I don't like Japa. You know? So you're saying, I don't like Japa, or it's subconsciously, you're, in your mind, there's this little thought down there that says, oh no, we have to do Japa again. And Krishna's looking at you. So, you don't like my name? Okay, forget you. You know, you can come back again until you learn to like my name. It's like, it's a person, and I'm saying, I don't like this person. And you would say, I would never say I don't like Krishna. Yeah, you wouldn't, but you're doing it. Every time you say, I don't like to chant, oh no, here we go again, I got to chant, it's so boring, whatever. You're actually saying, I don't like Krishna, it's just not, we're not conscious. And you may not feel it, but that's actually what's being said. Isn't that interesting? Like, you can't escape that saying, like, if, if you said, hmm, yeah, don't really like them. You'd be like, get this guy out of here, right? Probably, what do you think about the deities? Eh. Nah. <laughs> you think, what is wrong with him? Is he a devotee? He can't say that. What do you think about Japa? Uh, I'm not really into it. I'm into Kirtan. What's different? Why is that any different? It's the same thing, isn't it? Think about it. Think about it, right? So now, I would like you to say, I get to chant, I want to chant, and I love to chant. Everybody say this affirmation. I get to chant, I want to chant, and I love to chant. We need to turn our relationship around. And even if you say, but I don't feel like that. Well, we need to feel like that, so keep saying it till you feel like it. Because that's the relationship we want with the Holy Name. Yes? Hare Krishna. Okay, my next question is, do we have time for more questions? One last one. We have our Japa Affirmations book, and we have Japa Affirmations cards, and we have a poster also. And it will, the mood that I'm talking about is all contained in these books, and you can use them, and the cards, you can use them for Japa. And uh, it really helps, yeah. So, okay, one last question. Hare Krishna Prabhu, Dandar Pranam. Uh, my question is, uh, first of all, thank you so much for this uh, really uh, very heavy session given by you. I'm really grateful for you, to you. And uh, there is a sense of urgency in us that uh, we want uh, we want our good health, our good relationship, uh, uh, money also in life. But there is no sense of urgency because we have just a ritualistic life. So how can we develop that sense of urgency for Krishna, Radha Krishna? Yeah. Well, I think, as we were saying earlier, well, well, well let's let's look at this. There's a purport in a, I believe it's Chaitanya Charitamrita, where Prabhupada says, Mahaprabhu comes in a day of Brahma. So if you do 24 hours of Brahma, well, day and night, because or we say day means 24. Prabhupada says it means 12. So we use day as 24 hours. That's 8,640,000,000 years. Mahaprabhu comes once. The Mahaprabhu that gives prema in this Kali Yuga. He comes in other ages, but it's Vaidhi Bhakti. It's worship of Lakshmi and Narayan. So he comes once in a day of Brahma. So 8,640,000,000 years is kind of a long time. Isn't it? And so Prabhupada says, if you miss this chance, you will have to wait another 8,640,000,000 years. It's like, okay. You know, I think I should get to the front of the line because that's a long line to be at the end of, right? That's a lot of bodies. That's a lot of suffering. It's interesting that he would even have to try to convince us that in one life you, could, you can go back to God and in one lifetime you don't have to wait 8 billion years. Like, why would you have to convince anybody of that? It's like, you know, you, you have, um, we were wherever, driving somewhere, and they had all these, like, high-end cars, like, really high-end. You know, we're talking, like, hundreds of thousands of dollar cars, right? So let's say I owned one of these car dealerships and I had like lots of Rolls Royces, Lamborghinis, what's the other one? It's a Bentley, what's another one? Maserati, Maser Maserati, yeah. Maserati's more affordable, it's like 200000 $150,000. And I said, Prabhu's, come down to my office 
And you can choose any car there for one thousand dollars. In today's money, what is that? How many rupees? Eighty thousand. For eighty thousand rupees, you could choose any car. And you ask me a question. You say, Prabhu, thank you for that offer, but I'm not feeling the urgency. What could you tell me to like be willing to sacrifice my hard-earned thousand, eighty thousand rupees to buy to get a car that's like eighty crore rupees? I'm like, what kind of question is that? Like, so Prabhupada got that question all the time. That's what Prabhupada was dealing with. So Prabhupada repeatedly would say. I just want to remind you, those are 80 crore cars which you're getting for 80,000 rupees. So I think you should go down there, like right now, before they're all gone. Because once they're gone, you won't have that offer for another 8,640,000,000 years. Hmm, let me think about that. Hmm. that. That's the problem of being born in Kali Yuga. Like our brains don't work. You know? So the guru is like, he's looking for the switches and he's trying to turn it. Let's try to turn this switch on. 8,640,000,000 mil, year switch. That didn't seem to work. Okay, let's try this one. In one lifetime, you can go back to Godhead. Hmm, I don't know. I've got a lot of ambition. Well, let's try this one. Only 16 rounds and four princes. Yeah, but that's kind of hard. He's like trying to turn all the switches and our switches are like, he's like, ah, ah. they're all stuck. Right? Isn't it? That's Kali Yuga. So that's the problem of being born in Kali Yuga. Like the brain is like really dusty and dull, and isn't it? And so this is how Prabhupada wanted us to, wanted us to create urgency. Hello, you've been in the material world forever. Forever is a very long time. Yes or no? Yes. It's a really long, how long is forever? It's really long. You've been here for a really long time and you're probably going to live another 50 years or so and within 50 years, which is like that in eternal time, you could be dancing with Krishna. Hello, is anybody home? Did anybody hear that? Srila Prabhupada, do we have to chant 16? Can it be four? This is the, this is the response Prabhupada's getting to this. Because I was there and I saw it and I saw Prabhupada always talking about this life, go back to God. You can do it, it's simple, it's easy. Srila Prabhupada, but it's so difficult. It's like, hello, you've been here for millions of lifetimes. You can get out in this lifetime. All you have to do is take two hours a day and chant and like try to chant. And you know, it's not hard to eat prasadam, is it? You know, gambling's not that much of a problem, you know. Get rid of your tea. You can go back to Godhead and, you know, just, you know, be married. And if you're not married, be celibate. And if you're married, you know, control yourself. And, and you go, 1,000, uh, 80,000 rupees. Hmm, that's a lot of money. It's a lot of money for a toothbrush, but it's not a lot of money for a Maserati. <laughs> right? So is 80,000 rupees a lot of money? Not for a mansion for a little shack, maybe. So when you're saying, right, it's so hard, I have to try. But you have to look at what you're getting. You have to look at what you're buying. And all of a sudden, you realize, wow, this is a once in a, not a once in a lifetime opportunity. It's a once in a material existence opportunity. And all I have to pay is 1,000, 80,000 rupees. This is crazy. This is insane. I would have to be the stupidest person that ever walked the planet to not run down there as fast as I can and buy that car, right? That's the point Prabhupada's trying to make. And so if we can transpose that onto Krishna consciousness and realize this is a once in material existence opportunity, am I so stupid that I'm like, but you know, I always wanted to be an actor and you know, it's like, I just can't give up that desire and it's so hard, you know, to give up tea and I really like onions. And we're looking at you and like, did you actually say that? Like, yeah, his brain is not working. <laughs> we got to get in there and work it, you know, so we throw the shlokas at you, right? 
we should, I'm not saying you, I'm saying all of us. We throw the shlokas at you, we keep telling you, you know, eight billion years is a long time to hang around to get, a, you know, to get this offer, you know. That, that's, that's how we do it. So we, we appreciate the, the rarity of it and we think, okay, whatever I have to do, this is so rare, whatever I have to do, I'm just going to do it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Hare Krishna. It's not a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. It's a once-in-universal universal existence opportunity. And if I don't, if there's any definition of stupid, it's this. If I don't take advantage of Lord Chaitanya's mercy, I get the gold medal for stupid. <laughs> it doesn't get any stupider than that, right? That's how we should think. Yes? <laughs> so another special offer is that Mahatma Prabhu is going to be there in the evening and tomorrow morning as well. My request is, please do not miss this offer. <laughs> that would be the stupidest thing to do. <laughs> thank you very much. Let us thank His Grace Mahatma Prabhu, Mahatma Prabhu for once chanting the Hare Krishna Mahamant. Hare Krishna! Hare Krishna! 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 Hare Hare! Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. So since today is uh, Advaita Acharya's uh, appearance day, uh, we are going to fast till 12 o'clock. We are going to fast till 12 o'clock. So today we are not going to fast till 12 o'clock. But in the morning and in the morning, we will have to fast till 12 o'clock. Can I say one thing about Advaita Acharya that I read this morning? And it applies to what we are talking about. It applies exactly to, to the last point. As, you, as we know, Advaita Acharya, he called Mahaprabhu to come down. Why? Because he didn't think he could deliver the fallen souls. And I was reading that and I was thinking, Mahavishnu, coupled with Sadashiva, comes down and he's saying, this is a tough job, these people in Kali Yuga, I don't think I can deal with them. <laughs> so this really explains the meaning of Patita, you know, <laughs> like, you know. And so he's thinking only Mahaprabhu can do it. And Mahaprabhu tried to do it as Krishna. And, you know, the Gita did it, it didn't. So he comes with the holy name. And so we have faith that no matter how fallen we are, the holy name can purify us because even. Even Mahavishnu himself couldn't do it. He had to have Mahaprabhu come and, and put the spicing in the holy name of Prema in the mood of the Brajbasis for it to work. And so we're in a really good position, right? We may be the lowest and the worst and the stupidest, whatever, but this Maha Mantra, Param Vijayate Sri Krishna Sankirtan, you can be whatever, Jagai and Madai or worse, this Maha Mantra has the potency. And so we should have faith Right? Mahaprabhu has come with like this Mahaprabhu's medicine, he can cure he can cure people who are dead. This medicine is so potent. Go to the cemetery, give it to people, they'll be dancing out of their graves. <laughs> we are dead spiritually, right? But we can be dancing with this nectar. And so I think that's a really significant point to meditate on today, you know. Thank you. Hare Krishna. <laughs> <laughs> The next program is you go to the table and buy all my books. <laughs> and make sure you buy 10 for all your friends. All right. <laughs>